Before his death, he told them that there would be a crucifixion, that the Son of Man would be crucified. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. My name is Rod Hember. And I'm Janice. This is Quick Study Television, a program designed to take you through the Bible in one year. From Genesis 1 to Revelation 22, we are exploring the 26th chapter of Matthew today alone. It's very interesting. Corey, what's up? I'm going to be focusing in on the Gospel of Matthew itself today. Excellent. Very good. And what did you do today? Today's Fabulous Friday. So that means a question for all of us from Matthew chapter 26. All right. Very good. Ryan, you're up. Well, today I'm examining a book in the Bible that's often ridiculed by critics. But is it really a whale of a tale or is it historically accurate? All right. It's a good question. We'll talk about all of this. Thank you, Corey and Ryan and Janice. But let's get our Bible guide out and let's begin to study the Word of God, chapter 26 of the book of Matthew. Today is our last day of studying the Gospel of Matthew on TV this year. So because of that, you and I are going to be focusing in on the physical book, the Gospel of Matthew. Now, I really don't think that there have been any other books so widely examined, criticized, and, and searched out and through rather than the four Gospels of the New Testament. So let's take a look at Matthew. Even though our Bibles today place the New Testament Gospel of Matthew first in the list of Gospels, it's believed that Matthew was the second Gospel composed after the Gospel of Mark. Matthew distinguishes itself from Mark by adding two chapters about the birth of Jesus, containing lengthy speeches and teachings of Christ, and adding some information about the resurrection. While the Gospel itself does not claim direct authorship on its pages, there is plenty of external evidence that can be gathered from ancient sources. All of that evidence points to Matthew Levi, a tax collector called by Jesus who became one of the Twelve Apostles. Very early on, if not right away, Matthew's name was attached to copies of the Gospel, which is why we call it the Gospel of Matthew. The early church father Papias also recorded for his readers that Matthew composed his gospel in the Hebrew language and everyone translated as they were able. This tells us two pieces of information. One, that it was Matthew who wrote, and two, that it was first written in the Hebrew language. While there is no surviving manuscript of an original Hebrew copy, Matthew had both the bilingual knowledge as a Jewish Roman tax collector and a cultural incentive as a Jewish Christian to create his gospel in Hebrew and Greek editions. Some skeptics, when noticing that Matthew seems to borrow from the Gospel of Mark, argue that as one of the Twelve Apostles, Matthew would never have borrowed from Mark, a non-apostle. This argumentation dissolves with the recognition that Mark wrote with the authority of his teacher, the Apostle Peter. As recorded in all of the Gospels, Peter was present at events that many of the other disciples were not. It's also worth noting that if an ancient author was trying to fake a gospel and give it credibility by claiming it was written by an apostle, Matthew would not have been a good choice. Culturally, he was seen as a traitor. Tax collectors were generally detested. It's worth noting that later fake gospels were labeled after more important apostles like Peter, James, and John, but never after Matthew. You know, I said earlier in today's program that I really don't think that there has been any other books more widely scrutinized and criticized than the four New Testament Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Now, don't misunderstand me. I am not complaining here. I think that this is actually appropriate and has yielded amazing results for Christianity. You know, the study of the historical Jesus, don't believe the naysayers, uh, you know, on YouTube who will just pop up and everybody's an expert and will tell you, you know, the Jesus of the Gospels isn't real. Well, that is not the scholarly consensus whatsoever, uh, which is really interesting when you begin to look into the studies of the, of the Gospels. Now, it's appropriate for us to very carefully examine the gospel claims and, and the gospels themselves because Jesus Christ made a pretty outrageous claim 
to divinity. He claimed to be God, to be the son of God, to be a part of the Trinity. And not only that, the gospels claim that he was crucified. Yes, he died, but then physically resurrected from the dead. And that was God's check mark, his seal of approval on the ministry of Jesus Christ, not only verifying that everything Jesus taught was true, but also that Jesus now, because he died and resurrected from the dead, has the ability to forgive sins and is proof that one day Christians will be resurrected from the dead. So when you hear scholars talking about a, a, a historical criticism of the gospels, this is something to shout about. It's good because the truth always wins in the end. God demonstrates his grace in many ways. One is through the stories in the book of Matthew. Now a woman is highlighted who anointed Jesus Christ while a man secretly made a deal with the high priest and his officials to betray Jesus Christ. This man is Judas Iscariot. He was one of his disciples. In fact, he was the one who handled the money. This is the beginning of the end, so it looks for Jesus Christ. Now, when we begin to understand what God did and how God did it, we realize what God gave to conquer sin and to make us right with him. You see, everything embarrassing for human nature is presented in the crucifixion. Also, women had a unique place in the time of leading Jesus Christ's crucifixion and resurrection. In fact, it was women who first saw Jesus Christ when he had risen from the dead. Men must never, ever make less of a woman before God. And men, we must always follow God and not a woman. Matthew 26, verses 1 through 16. Now it came to pass when Jesus had finished all these sayings that he said to his disciples, You know that after two days is the Passover, and the Son of Man will be delivered up to be crucified. Then the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders of the people assembled at the palace of the high priest, who was called Caiaphas, and plotted to take Jesus by trickery and kill him. But they said not during the feast, lest there be an uproar among the people. And when Jesus was in Bethany at the house of Simon the leper, a woman came to him having an alabaster flask of very costly fragrant oil, and she poured it on his head as he sat at the table. But when his disciples saw it, they were indignant, saying, Why this waste? For this fragrant oil might have been sold for much and given to the poor. But when Jesus was aware of it, he said to them, Why do you trouble the woman? For she has done a good work for me. For you have the poor with you always, but me you do not have always. For in pouring this fragrant oil on my body, she did it for my burial. Assuredly, I say to you, wherever this gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will also be told as a memorial to her. Then one of the twelve, called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests and said, What are you willing to give me if I deliver him to you? And they counted out to him thirty pieces of silver. So from that time he sought opportunity to betray him. Matthew chapter 26, verses 1 through 16. You know, when we deal with Matthew, uh, he's writing the scripture here and he's telling us what Jesus Christ said. And Jesus Christ always tells us the truth about what's going to happen. He says, when Jesus had finished all these sayings, he said to his disciples. So these are the people that he's chosen. He said, you know that after two days, the Passover is coming, 
the Son of Man will be delivered for crucifixion. What? Are you serious? You're talking about dying? And of course, the disciples didn't really understand. They didn't really know that. But yes, Jesus Christ was telling them all the time before he was ever killed that there would come a time when they would have to make a decision and he would be killed. But he knew that that wouldn't be the end. And that's what we're going to begin to talk about today as we talk about this. And if you have your Bible guide, turn to today's page because it's going to be good. And I want to tell you something. If you don't, go to BibleDiscoveryTV.com. BibleDiscoveryTV.com. And when you go there, click on Donate, make a donation there. It'll take you right to the Bible guide. It is excellent. But when we look at this, we have to understand that there are ways of truth that God is talking to us. Now, in the ways of truth, this is best titled as the betrayal, the betrayal. We read Matthew chapter 26. That's the only chapter that we're designated to read today because we're going to focus on this and look at it carefully. Looking at Matthew chapter 26, verses 1 to 16. Let's pray. Father, I pray today that as we look at this passage, we would understand what you are saying. We would realize what you're doing. And we would make sure, Father, that we hear what you're saying so that we can apply it to our lives and understand the cost that you paid for sin. In Jesus' name, and we all said together, amen. Listen carefully to the chapter here as we begin to start it out. It says, now it came to pass when Jesus had finished all these sayings that he said to his disciples, you know that after two days is the Passover, and the Son of Man will be delivered up to be crucified, the Son of Man. Then the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders of the people assembled at the palace of the high priest, who was called Caiaphas, and plotted to take Jesus by trickery and to kill him. But they said, listen, here's what they said, not during the feast, lest there be an uproar among the people. Now, this is interesting because as we look at this, before the death of Jesus Christ, he told the disciples he would be crucified. Jesus knew what was coming. He understood everything that was going on. Now, the disciples didn't. They didn't understand, but Jesus Christ did because Jesus Christ is fully God and fully man. Beloved, let me tell you something today. When you pray to God, you are praying to somebody who knows what is going to happen in your future. So when you pray to God, you can say, Lord, help me to understand what's going to happen so that we can be prepared and ready. Prepare me, O oh God. So when you come to God, you're not coming to him as somebody who doesn't know, but you're coming to him as somebody who does know. So that's very important when we pray, when we practice our prayer. Well, let's go on to the scripture because it gets even more interesting. And when Jesus was in Bethany, he's in a small town just out of uh, Jerusalem, at the house of Simon the leper, a woman came to him having an alabaster flask of very costly, fragrant oil. And she poured it on his head as he sat at the table. But when his disciples saw it, they were indignant, saying, Why this waste? For this fragment oil, or this, this fragrant oil might have been sold for much and given to the poor. But when Jesus was aware of it, he said to them, listen, why do you trouble the woman? Why do you trouble the woman? For she has done a good work for me. For you have the poor with you always, but me you do not have with you always. For in pouring this fragrant oil on my body, she did it for my burial. Assuredly, I say to you, wherever this gospel, this good news is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will be told as a memorial to her. Now that's interesting, beloved. Listen carefully. The woman gave an offering. She gave an offering of the oil. See, Jesus Christ honored it. Offerings are for God. They're not to solve a problem, you know. I know people who uh, have people, they, they tell others about offerings and they say, we have this problem, you know, if we don't get this done or get that done, and, and that's interesting, but 
really, people give offerings because God speaks to their heart, not because there's a problem that needs to be fixed. People give offerings because God says, I want you to give this money to that ministry. I want you to give this money to that ministry or that ministry because I've told you to. Now, how many of us would give if God told us to rather than just seeing a problem? We should understand that when we give an offering, the gift of that offering is to God. We need to realize that. Very important. Well, let's go back to the passage because passage uh, says in 26 verse 14, then one of the 12 called Judas Iscariot went to the chief priest and said, what are you willing to give me if I deliver him to you? Wow, another offering. And they counted out to him 30 pieces of silver. That's the price of a slave. 30 pieces of silver. So from that time, he sought an opportunity to betray Jesus Christ. Now, this is interesting because 30 pieces of silver was what Judas paid to betray Jesus Christ, or Judas was paid to betray Jesus Christ. There's no price that we can pay to accomplish what Jesus did. Now, you know how this ends because Judas sees the problems that he's done and it's important that we understand Judas ended his life in that way because he saw that this is not going to work. And he couldn't see any way out of it, so he ended his life. And he threw the money back at the priest and all of that. They said, what is that to us? They bought a field and that's where they bury people and all of that. So it's important for us to recognize that Jesus Christ gave himself to us. So when we give to him, that's an offering. But there are times when people buy things and when they buy things, that's not necessarily a, an offering, if you know what I mean. You see, there are offerings to God Almighty and then there are offerings. But if you want an offering to be honored through the word of God, if you want a giving to be honored through that way, you give according to the Bible. You give according to what God said. Because the Bible tells us the truth about giving and about offerings. Sins are forgiven by Jesus Christ. Now, this offends people who hear him do this, and it's really sensitive. But Jesus tells the truth. We'll talk about that and much more next time as we begin the Gospel of Mark with the second chapter tomorrow on Quick Study. Make sure you join us. Ryan? Well, as you probably guessed, today we're studying the account of the prophet Jonah. Now, critics of the Bible laugh at this story and bring two main objections forward. First, that there is no known sea creature that could swallow a man whole. And second, that no one could possibly survive in the belly of a fish. Is that so? Let's study. Critics of the Bible scoff at the apparent absurdity of the story of the prophet Jonah. According to Jonah chapter 1, verse 17, this prophet, while at sea and in rebellion to God, is swallowed whole by a great fish, and then after three days and nights, is vomited out onto dry land. Two objections to the historical reality of this account are often brought up. First, it is assumed that there is no known sea creature that could swallow a man whole. And second, that no one could possibly survive in the belly of a fish. Before responding to these objections, it is important to understand that there are several good reasons to believe that the book of Jonah is an accurate historical account. First, the writing style of this book is that of a normal historical narrative. 
Second, Jonah is identified as a historical figure in other portions of scripture, including the Gospels where Jesus Christ himself affirms him as a historical figure. And third, most Christian and Jewish scholars of the not too distant past accepted Jonah's mission trip to Nineveh as a reality. If this is not enough, archeologists have also uncovered the ancient ruins of the city of Nineveh and have proven that it was an enormous city during biblical times. Furthermore, the two assumptions made that a person could not be swallowed whole by a great fish or survive the encounter have been refuted by authenticated historical reports of individuals who had their own Jonah experience. Indeed, in 1758, a great white shark swallowed a sailor after he fell overboard. After being fired at with a deck cannon, this huge shark vomited out the man who not only survived, but was also unharmed. On a second occasion, on October 14, 1771, the Boston Post Boy newspaper reported the incredible story of Marshall Jenkins, who was swallowed by a huge sperm whale. After re-emerging out of the water, the whale vomited him out, much bruised but not seriously injured. It is clear to see that while the account of Jonah is incredible, it is nonetheless strongly supported by the evidence. This also demonstrates the historical accuracy and reliability of the Bible. It shouldn't surprise us that all the evidence supports this account of the prophet Jonah. The Bible, after all, is God's word, and so it speaks the truth. So did God really say that a man was swallowed by a great sea creature and spit up on the third day? He sure did. Jesus Christ himself even confirmed this account as actual history in Matthew chapter 12, and that should automatically settle things, at least in the minds of those who call him Lord and Savior. You know, this is interesting, Ryan, because uh, a lot of people, again, are looking at the Bible as a religious book and not a scientific book, and they say, well, there's all these allegories and all these things in there that aren't true. But the truth is that how do you know they're not true? You're making a judgment on the mm -hmm. Bible about them. Right. And Jonah, the book of Jonah is a historical, typical historical narrative. Yeah. Right? So, I mean, you've got to look at this, right? Mm -hmm. It's obviously not poetry. It's obviously not wisdom literature. You know, it's... It's historical yeah. narrative, and it's one of my favorite books. Yeah, actually. and 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 there there are allegories in the Bible, but they're quite obvious when you know. And and it doesn't mean that uh, the truth that the allegory is presenting is not true. That's not what anyone's saying. An allegory can be true in its point in its mm -hmm. moral application, mm -hmm. but the story by which it's told is the the method in which it's told is literature. You yeah, know, that's, not... I mean, it, it is interesting because uh, the people, you know, you, you, they sort of wash the Bible. Oh, it's religious. I won't deal with it. But, but actually the Bible is a, a narrative that's historical and it's Much several it, different yes. kinds. It's a prophetic book. Uh, it's a history book in many ways. Uh, I believe it's a that theological history, a though. theological mm -hmm. fine. That's yeah. fine. Yeah. I think all history is theological. <laughs> that's my own feeling. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but anyway, um, and it's a science book that's theological. But science is the removal of God, and that's the definition of science. It's actually uh, finding out or discovering how things work. But the truth is that when you when you look at this, science says that you have to reproduce it, and you have to make sure to that yes. the scientific Method. experiment or mm -hmm. the scientific method. But how do you do that if you're not God? That's where it takes faith because you're going to say, well, God's going to do this or God's going to do that. When you start saying things like that, how do you reproduce it? So it's important for us to remember that the word of God tells us what it is. That's very important. Mm -hmm. Also, uh, you talked about Matthew. Mm -hmm. This Let's go through this. Matthew was written to who? <laughs> Matthew was written to the Jews. Yes, it was written to the Jews. But I think, you know, when you're when you're looking at, you know, if 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 you believe that God was the inspirer of Matthew, it was written to all of us, I think. So yeah, it had an original target audience in mind, which you it, that really does help in interpretation, uh, and and it helps you to understand why certain narratives are in there and why certain ones aren't included. Because when you're an author writing to a specific audience, you are are going to grab what will really make the most mm -hmm. impact. So, so it's that designed, makes a yes. It's designed for the the Jewish people. Mark was written to who? 
the, uh, the Gentiles, yeah. So really, so he's got immediately in that book more than any other book. It's really fast, and it's you know written for centurions and it's written really for all it's that. probably the first one written. Actually, I'm going to be talking about that on tomorrow's show. So don't get too ahead <laughs> here because tomorrow well, we're jumping into Mark, not today. Luke also is written to Gentiles, the Gentiles, and yeah. he's a it, Gentile. It appears, yeah. And so he's he's a doctor, and he writes it more differently. Now he's not a doctor like we think of doctors, but he is a medical specialist um, yeah. in the day yeah. and it's important. But then John is different. John the is last written, one written uniquely. And it's a, a lot later than the other gospels. Yeah. yeah. And mm -hmm. it seems that John had access to the other gospels when he wrote it. At least that's what I feel. Yeah. Well, and, and it appears that, you know, uh, Matthew and Luke also had access to Mark when they were writing their gospels as well. Very there's a lot of, interesting. Yeah. Very. It's, 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 it's a really interesting thing once you have a good grasp of what is in the Gospels to mm -hmm. then grab a commentary that talks more about how the Gospels were written, like how, how scholars believe the Gospels were written and things like that. And, um, you know, the Gospels that you said, they're the most talked about books. I, I agree with you. Yeah. And uh, we have a program that we work with and we do with Jim Canelon and he goes through the Gospels every mm -hmm. year. That's what he does, just the Gospels. And it's important to recognize that's the message of God, the central message of Jesus Christ, the theme through the whole Bible is the Gospels. Mm. Because God talks about how he came, how he died, and how he rose again. I think that's very important. So we need to keep that in mind as we focus on that. Also, just a quick reminder that uh, we could use your help. Uh, we are supported by gifts, just like, you know, when God, when you pray and God speaks to you, just make sure that you do what God says. That's all I would say. And we're not going to tell you how much and all that, but we're going to ask you to pray about it and do what the Lord tells you to do, because that's very important. And uh, we could use your help uh, right about now. So thank you so much for that. Also, we'll send you the Bible guide if you ask for it. So ask for the Bible guide. We'll send it to you. It's original copy. Okay. Question. It's fabulous. It's always fabulous. And we're taking <laughs> a look in Matthew chapter 26. Now, I can either have you answer it right off, or I can give you the three options. So let's just start out with the question first of all, and then you can decide whether you need okay. more information or not. All right. So whose house was Jesus at in Bethany when a woman poured very costly fragrant oil on him? Whose house was Give he us at? the three choices. Would you like the three choices? Sure. All why right. not? Number one, the house of Simon. Number two, the house of Caiaphas. Or number three, the house of Peter. There's your I, answer. I know, but... Okay, well then what is it? <laughs> you can't go, well, I know. And then... Well, Simon the leper. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's is. the one. That, <laughs> is. That, that is the one. And that's in Matthew 26, verse 6. Now, do you know who also lived in Bethany? Anybody else have any ideas um, who also lived there? Mary and Martha, right? Lazarus. Very good. Mary yeah. and Martha. And, and uh, this was also the site of Christ's what? Anybody have any ideas there? You're looking at it. You just looked at it. I saw you. <laughs> you looked at it. I can't it. say anything. Of Christ's but... ascension. That's right. also where it happened. And do you know what Bethany means? Oh, I can't yes. remember. I do know These this. These are all bonus questions. Mm. Bethany means the house of poor. I'm uh, sorry, I was trying, I was of trying to tell her. <laughs> so there you go. Little, little details on Bethany. And yes, it was Simon the leper. Jesus went there for a meal and um, a woman came and anointed his head with oil. There That's you go. amazing. Good, really, really amazing. Good story. It is. So join us tomorrow. It's going to be a great day. And let's continue to study God's Word.